Hello, everyone, and welcome to Film Independent Presents, our year-round screening and Q&A series, now virtual. I'm Brian Sheehan from Film Independent. First off, I'd like to thank some of our ardent supporters, uh, our lead sponsor, the Hollywood Foreign Press Association, and our screening partner, Vision Media. Thank you so much for joining us to talk all things topside from Celine Held and Logan George. And uh, we have a very special guest moderator in filmmaker Ira Sachs. And without further ado, I will let Ira take it away from here. Thank you. Um, it's good to be here. I'm sorry we're not all in a room together, which has a certain warmth, but it's, it's a different kind of room. And um, it's great to be here with Logan and Celine and to talk about their beautiful film, which I had a chance to see this week. Um, it's really impressive work. Um, I found the authenticity, the, the, you know, on, on all different levels in terms of the subject of the film, um, which is not an easy one to approach with a kind of um, rigor that I feel that you did. And um, I was also very impressed by the authenticity of, of what you created. And I think that's a combination, it seems to me, of all the different skills you two together brought to this project, both as writers, as actors, as the editor. Um, and, um, you know, it's just, it's just, a, it's an impressive collaboration among the whole group, but also among the two of you. And I wanted to sort of start by, by really talking about the genesis of this film, um, where, where you entered and, and how you got interested in this story. Yeah. Um, Hi yeah. everybody, thanks for, yeah. thanks for watching the film. Also Ira, we're a huge fans, so yeah. this is just such an <laughs> honor. Um, so um, yeah, the, I was working um, a, literally like seven years ago now yeah. um, at, a, uh, at a kindergarten on the Lower East Side that had a lot of low income families. Um, and a, a little boy was part of my class. It was through Jumpstart AmeriCorps. Um, and he was removed one day by Child Protective Services, which is called ACS here in New York, Association of Children's Services. Um, and we found out that his mom had been applying for jobs and marking she had a dependent, but marking she had no permanent place of residence mm -hmm. and that was illegal in New York. And um, she came at the end of the day to pick up her son from school and it was just devastating. She didn't know and, and he went to live at this place um, called the, the child. We, we've dealt with all these things now a lot because um, we, went into like a lot of research for the film. Um, it's this, j just this like basically purgatory center for kids between going back to their parents and going into foster, um, foster homes. And it just really struck me as something that I didn't know was happening. And there's like a lot of gray lines within that. There's, mm -hmm. there's these rules that people follow, um, but they don't always fit every situation. Mm -hmm. And to me, it just felt like um, that there was a story and there was a story that I wanted to tell in a cinematic way. Um, at the same time, I was reading Jennifer Toth's book, um, The Mole People, and there was a line in it, which is the opening of the film um, about adults as young as five. I was also babysitting children on the Upper West Side who were children um, and who had these big imaginations and all this stuff. And, and in combination with working at this kindergarten where kids just seemed to be grown up so much more than these other kids. Mm -hmm. And so I felt like that there was a story in a tunnel that, that we could tell that just hadn't seen, been seen on screen before where we could you know, also bring light a little bit to this issue of childhood homelessness and how there's this fear of these groups in control because oftentimes um, there, are, there are rules that are followed that aren't always the right rules to be followed for particular families, I guess. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of where it came from. Yeah, mm -hmm. Celine shared the script with me after she'd written like a you know a, a version of it, and I was really taken by it by the location, by this tunnel, you know, underground beneath New York, and I, I was really drawn to that. I, I, I took it and, and rewrote the first ten pages, and it was like like this is what I think, and <laughs> but it was, was really good. This was the but this mm -hmm. that's why we started working together was this script is like it's oh. like the then it was the genesis of our whole career working together, like all of our shorts and everything was. Was were written and directed to to prove that we could you know make this film. So, and and you know, so that was seven years ago when you started working on it. I guess that was 
Yeah, we've well, been working on the film for, for seven years. Um, I, I've been working on this film for seven years. Right. The first time yeah. I went down into the tunnel was 2012. Um, and, and I gave you the script about five years ago, right? 2015, yes. Yeah, so yeah. can, can you remember, I mean, is it possible now that you have a completed film to remember what the shooting, um, what the effect of the shooting process had on the film that we're now seeing today, um, in terms of the difference between the script and that process from going from being writers of your own material to, to then the directors and then obviously also cutting and finishing the film. But how is the film different than you expected? Yeah. It's wildly different. It changed a lot with casting, I think, um, mm -hmm. with finding Shayla. Yeah, there were a lot of variables. And I think one of the biggest hurdles to making the script was there were two big things that we felt like, you know, you needed to find to know that you could make it. And one was the tunnel location, like what that set was going to be. And then the other was the casting of Little uh, and, and finding her and getting to work with Shayla. Um, like that just broke out so many new opportunities and created like a, a very different dynamic that we were exposed to a little bit from you know, the idea of working with children in our, in our shorts, shorts. Mm -hmm. but the, the process of having that limited amount of time with your, with your lead protagonist dictated the entire, you know, event of the day and how you structured your entire schedule. So there, there were lots of compromises you have to make. I mean, I, obviously like on, in every production, but I think when we were ultimately- I, I, I call them not compromises, I call them decisions. <laughs> I don't know. Because, because it's always, everything is about Figuring out what the boundaries are and yeah. how you're going to make it. What what other just what are, what else are you deciding? But sort of what whether this is more important than that is you're always making decisions as a director about what to prioritize, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, child hours. I mean, you know this from your films, that, but the kid hours are are t are really tough. And yeah, ultimately, right. it's not about oh we can go late and we can make it make it work. Right. You are stuck. Um, yeah. so we did a lot of, of pre-pro and tried to figure out every single different scenario we possibly could. And in the end, things happen and Shayla's angry that day. And so this scene now, she's angry and that's great. Mm -hmm. And we have to work with what we have in the moment and who she is. Mm -hmm. We worked with her for a, honestly a year. We met her May, 2018 and we mm -hmm. shot April, 2019. So we worked with her for one year in advance and we rewrote the script to suit who she is mm -hmm. um, so that we, she wouldn't have to learn lines. We often yeah. feel like, uh, especially a child that young, that lines coming off their tongue yeah. often feel um, a little prescriptive. Um, so we wanted to work with a, with a child who felt free. Um, obviously yeah. there's some really sensitive material in the film that she was not at all ever subject to. Mm -hmm. um, and we often used a wig on a broom, literally on, or a hanger, actually it was out on a hanger yeah. um, because Sheila has really specific hair um, or a double in a wig and sometimes Logan in a wig, um, mm -hmm. seriously, <laughs> um, to play against so that she wouldn't be part of the, those conversations. Um, mm -hmm. but, but yeah, but everything else we shot her first basically and, and made the scene around what she gave us. Yeah. And, and did you find, what was it like working as an actor with her um, doing so many of the scenes together? Did you feel like you were trying to direct as you were acting or, or how do you two work in that fashion? Um, it, well, the, yeah, well, right? we, so this was, this was a similar setup to uh, one of our shorts where Celine also played a mother and we found a lot of success in um, Celine having an earpiece uh, that I could communicate to her with. So while she's, you know, in the scene working, um, we could also be in communication, wouldn't have to start, you know, over again and reset do different takes. Which was anything. our sound, amazing sound mixers idea, Dennis Rinaldi, mm, yeah. who came up with this incredible earpiece, which is so helpful because if um, we it were- It just allowed us to operate in like yeah. a way more, you know, flexible, uh, you know, environment and not have to be very prescriptive about where you know blocking needed to be or how to set things because a lot of the time you know you're working in these small shacks sometimes or very very closed quarters it allowed the room to just be you know the the dp who was our camera operator the the whole time uh Lloyd who's Meyer, insanely talented who's like responsible i mean you can see it like the movie is 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 the movie because of Lowell. and so he's yeah. holding the camera the whole time 
um, and like our, and then Buma, Shayla, and Celine. And so me being able to communicate in that way allowed us would allow us to sort of like jump around the scene and respond to whatever Shayla was giving us in the moment. And um, that proved to be uh, indispensable, you know, on on those days. Um, but yeah, you were. I mean, it's it's a it's a it's you feel torn when you're you know acting and directing on yeah. the you know naturally. I think probably I I think definitely never again. <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah, um, it it's uh, it's, you know, it's awesome. I feel the tension. So you know, I mean, you feel like it feels very organic that you're in that position. I mean, so oh, cool. Don't say never. You did I don't a good know. Job. Okay, so actually, you know, in Little Men, they're at Strasbourg. Yes. Um, I went, so we met at NYU, we both studied drama, and I went to Strasbourg. Mauricio, yeah, you know in, those uh, studios very well. <laughs> amazing. <laughs> so he did a good job training you. Yeah, I, well, yeah, I mean, there, the entire thing about the method is re-experiencing life on stage or on screen, and so that's what, um, we, we did do a lot of research on, on this film. We did a couple of different docs, one of which was actually supposed to premiere at South by this year um, in 2020. And another um, that's on street homelessness and another that's on um, mothers and children in homeless shelters in New York mm -hmm. that'll premiere next year or this year, I guess, 2021. Um, and that I just kept going back to. Um, and I just kept, I mean, even uh, the, the families that we met were, were super influential in, in creating the film and in writing the film and in, in being part of it. Um, I didn't I didn't want to necessarily put an actress through what I wanted an actress to do with Shayla in a year in advance in, in spending, I mean. I just don't think there would have been another way to do it. Like yeah. we, we spent so much time with Shayla and her family getting to know them, like the amount of time that Celine invested in that relationship and fostering that connection, which we knew was like the, the crux of the whole film. Like if that relationship didn't work and if you didn't see that, that trust and that comfort considering the amount of physicality that was gonna, you know, like there, you just, they needed to be completely in sync. And uh, for a short Caroline, um, it, we found that same, like not having that middleman of another, of another actress, yeah. but having Celine who, you know, we know what we want out of a scene. We're working in context. I'm able to look at the frame. Celine's able to be there, you know, in the moment responding to what Shay was giving her, like that was the recipe for being able to make our day and, it just, and get it just, through it. It worked. Yeah. Um, and it, we, I mean, the movie again, wouldn't exist without Shayla and without the magic mm -hmm. that she gave us and the comfortability she had. And we couldn't have afforded an actress who would have spent a year with her <laughs> in advance. So yeah, yeah. Out. Since we're talking about performance, I, can you talk a little bit about how you, um, how you both worked with other actors and, and what you, what your process is to create the worlds in which you're you're telling your story? Yeah, we. I mean, we 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 really believe in the sort of three lives of you know you, you make the script the best it can be, but you you've really got to be prepared to let it go. So we're not precious about our lines, yeah. uh, the way that they're written. Uh, certainly, if another act, if an actor's feeling you know inclined to say it in a different way, or like we really want that to you to feel comfortable in saying what you're saying and not like sort of fit around it. So. We tell that to our actors a lot. We give them a lot of references of um, characters from other films or a lot of doc video. Too. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we had, um, we had Jared a, meet yeah. with some people. Yeah, Jared Abrahamson plays less and he's insanely talented. Um, he he uh, has a lot of life experience, is not like um, a traditionally trained actor. Um, he actually grew up in a diamond mine in Canada and had yeah. Um, just this kind of rich background and uh, John is played by um, rapper Fatlip uh, mm -hmm. and this was his first time acting. Um, so we had a lot of first time actors really including myself um, be part of this production. Um, but we left it really, really open because again, we're, we're all about, you know, like we brought everybody together but the way that we built the sets and everything too, you know, for Shayla, you know, uh, we wanted to leave them as open as possible, not really box ourselves into a corner, you know, filming wise with lights or, you know, but leave it as much of a 360 degree environment as In, possible. On every set. So, you know, that she had the room to be able to, you know, go where she felt comfortable and, you know, move and, you know, not felt like she was going from A to B all the time. Yeah. And that meant that all the other actors around her, you know, um, had to respond in kin, so. But I think we should like, especially Fatlip who has two massive crazy scenes where he's yelling at people, me at the end with the, those were live trains going by. Mm -hmm. um, and then when DHS comes down the Department of Housing Services, 
um, and he's trying to distract them. Um, and he just, he, he, he went to like a different level. Yeah. His first scene we shot was, was his last scene in the film which is with a the live train. Very tall order. And it for was, an actor it's, you know, you time. can get wooden, you can get scared. It's, you have, we have like so many crew members down there with a camera. We had, yeah. that was one of the only two camera setups we had. Yeah. We had really limited time yeah. to get that scene while the trains were going. Yeah, in the middle of the night. And we had like <laughs> training with the trains. And so it was all this. A lot place. of moving parts and he did an amazing job. He was just incredible. And, and he pulled this out really on our last couple takes that where it just, it, it um, and I guess that is an example of how I worked as a director in that moment because Logan was further away because the, t the t way the tunnel was set up and I would just restart things. And yeah. when he was on a tear and I knew that we, we were getting where we needed to be at the beginning of the scene, I'd, I'd just go back um, as an actor um, without telling him what I was doing, <laughs> which frustrated him more and, and worked well. Can you talk a little bit about, you talked about your DP who did a wonderful job, um, Lowell Meyer. Can you talk about what kind of preparatory work you did in advance of the shoot? And I'm curious also how, for you, Logan, as an editor, how much, um, how much are you thinking about editing actually in the moment of shooting and, and, and also what kind of prep you were doing um, together? Logan, think about editing the entire time. Yeah, I, uh... We'd have like if I for for whatever reason I wasn't going to be on an um the editor on a project we'd want the editor there because I just think it's an invaluable perspective. It's but I'm I'm thinking as a director I don't know how you like I just feel like you should be thinking as an editor. It's like yeah. how the film gets made. So um, but Lowell, um, we did a mass amount of prep with Lowell. Lowell came out um I believe two literally two months in advance, right? Yeah, I mean, Lowell, and he just Lowell always talk, says He's that we, we we prepare too much, but yeah. you know, it's it's a it's a shot list. We'll we'll storyboard the really really complex stuff that we can. There was a lot that we wanted to stay like keep fluid, you know, and again not feel like okay, like this is exactly the way the shot needs to go. And we knew that there was going to be a lot of aggressive editing, and like I think sort of cinematically, like we knew we were always going to be building towards this very aggressive. Um, search for little at the end. Yeah. We knew that that was gonna be like a very intense, hard cutting, um, aggressive sound type, you know, like very visceral experience. So in that sense, we just like knew that everything needed to be preparing you as an audience member for that to happen. So, um, but constant conversations about- but the, the light in the tunnel is kind of the most brilliant yeah, thing. You want... The way he lit the tunnel, he came up with this way to have these, I don't know. He's going to be mad that I don't know what all this is called. Well, it was all just this idea of Lights. basically bouncing light into the ceiling of the uh, tunnel. Yeah. So that nothing, you know, because the, the tunnel in Rochester that we shot in. Which is a real tunnel. And it's based off of the Freedom Tunnel where people originally lived in the 80s and 90s in New York City. Yeah. But we shot in this sort of, it's like a black box of a, like a mile long stretch underneath the city of Rochester, which was great in terms of weather and like time of day because we could shoot any anytime we want, but there's no natural light down there when you're in the in the thick of things and we always wanted we you know credit to our art team and production uh designer nor like they built the whole city down there it's yeah, like the, it's the real thing um so the lull lit this tunnel with our with our gaffers these fluorescent Tyler. tubes basically bouncing into the ceiling because we knew we didn't want any kind of harsh light mm -hmm. and it's a, it's this really hard ask of saying you know, like to your DP that like, you know, we want to be able to stay fluid and stay really open and be able to pan the camera 180 degrees or 270 if we want. And you need to light the whole thing, but be prepared to light it, you know, from complete darkness, uh, this sort of general ambience, because we knew we wanted it to be so dark, you know, the first 25 minutes are take place on the ground. There's only, there's basically one entrance to the tunnel that's about a mile away from where we shot. And so he oh. had all these I mean, there. I guess there's a lot of behind the scenes unsung heroes of all uh -huh. the people who dragged that cable. But. Can I ask what um, what movies you were both watching and and that were really most inspiring for you as you as you constructed the the film? Well, Dark Days definitely is a huge influence. Um, yeah, just like a reference. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the story of the Freedom Tunnel. Um, but other movies, I mean, we're big fans of the Safdie brothers. We love mm -hmm. Heaven Knows What as reference. Yeah. That definitely came into it. Andrea Arnold's work in general um, was was big mm -hmm. for us. Um, um, who else was big for us? Or we were going for it. Um, I mean, we're 
the, the films that we see. And what a film, I mean, are the Dardans brothers, are they? We important? actually haven't, we, we haven't seen that many. I, I've seen um, Two Days, One Night, uh, uh, which was like, I think in the mid 2010s or so, uh, without knowing, but we haven't seen um, many of their work. We know it's, it's been We'd appreciate, I think that there's a level of, well, you know, I think one of the things that you did really well that they also do is that they're socially um, conscious films that have usually sort of social just, there's there's always something going on, but they're, what they really are is almost like a 1930s films because they're they're really plot driven. There is a conflict and you and you know the problem and you are trying to figure out. And I think, you know, there's a way in which any film becomes some sort of genre film and your film at a certain point becomes a, a, an action film. It becomes a thriller. And I think that, that really, you do that very well. well. And on the other side of that, I think like Eliza, Eliza Hedman and like Derek Sia France are, have been like really big um, mm -hmm. inspirations for us and Jeff Nichols too, definitely. Um, and, but uh, I don't know. What, I was just going to say that, yeah, that there was, I think it, there was a sensation that we were trying to communicate you know, above all else of like that feeling of desperation. And that's, you know, that that was sort of the the through line that was gonna carry you through the film and was, right. you know, building up towards that. Anxious cinema. Yeah. Is that what they call it? <laughs> like anxious, like, uh -huh. like we want you to not hopefully be able to breathe by the end. Um, yeah, and you don't really know how tense your body's getting as you're slowly you don't know watching. What position. We really wanted, yeah. I mean, this was, yeah. we wish, you know, we had the ability still to trap people in a theater and have that real, you know, the, the sound design of it all sort of coming together because that was really the goal. It's only, you know, it's less than an hour and a half, uh, but we wanted to really just like, you know, hit you hard with something. It's a jolt. Well, yeah. there's a bunch of people who've written lots of questions. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you a few. This is from Jeffrey Finner. Can you talk about how you envisioned the backstory between Nikki and Little? Was she born in the tunnel? If not, how old was she when you moved there, when she moved there? Did you know her father? Loved the immediacy of the film and your relationship, but curious about how much backstory you actually felt was necessary. So Nikki herself has a lot of um, backstory, um, but uh, we felt that, a lot of people felt, even the reviewers felt that John was Little's father. For us, that is not the case. Mm -hmm. um, Little's father's unnamed, um, a past boyfriend of Nikki's, we don't think he knows that Little exists. Um, it was really important for us that we didn't dive every time that we did that on a script level we just felt like it was putting Nikki into some sort of like sort of just trying to categorize like why she what why her life was the way it was and trying to like sum it up and justify it and it felt considering that we you know we didn't want to have any kind of flashbacks or you know it was all supposed to take place in real time and take place from Little's point of view who doesn't you know isn't going to be picking up on any of the any of those points of you know exposition, we wanted to leave the backstory purposefully very, very you know vague for the viewer, so that you're thinking about it actively, you know, and, and you're walking away, you know, wondering what kind of life she led up to this point. There were a few uh, women that I spoke to that I uh, took parts of their story and and made it Nikki's own about um, the way that she smokes rolled cigarettes specifically and, and how she knows New York so well. And, and so, and I believe she was raised by a single mother in New York. And I, I think that she befriended John who, who took her down into the tunnel. Mm -hmm. um, and John was her dealer for a while. Um, but I, for me, the strongest answer is that little from birth has been in the tunnel, right? So that's what we decided to go with. But in, in a bigger part of my heart, I feel that little had existed for part of her life up top and that Nikki made the choice to bring her down when it when it just got too hard staying on friends' couches. Yeah, um, and then she doesn't remember those years. She's exactly. Too young. And, and yeah, so and Little's memory exists in the tunnel only, which is the only important answer because we see the world from her perspective. And it is all that she knows. Yeah. And how much of that kind of those kind of conversations were you having with with the young actor? Um, None. None. <laughs> she she and I. Um, She's, uh, she's very special, um, very special little girl. I uh, have a large story here that I won't, I won't get into, but um, she and her family were struggling um, with homelessness throughout her life. Um, and her family now lives in a house in Staten Island and they're doing really well. Mm -hmm. It's a family of five, she's a middle child. Um, so um, we got involved with the family, met them um, through our casting director, Jennifer Venditti, who 
cast Jess Little and our casting director Rebecca Dealey cast everyone else um, who's wonderful. But Jennifer found Shayla and um, it ended up becoming this whirlwind of an experience of not knowing that we had met her so early because we've lost financing for the film. We were supposed to shoot that fall. And so we had met this girl. We we're like, this is her. She's perfect. Yeah. And, and we didn't find financing until that next spring. And, and it felt like this race of trying to get it before she aged out of the role. But on a day to day level, you know, it was um, 26, uh, you know, main shoot days. And she was there all of those days for the hours that she could be. So with her dad. Yeah. They so, had a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was a great set for her. And um, she, but we didn't want to sort of give her any preconceived notion of what she was walking into any day because it was, we wanted to keep up the excitement for her. So every day she'd come to set and we, she would get a sense of, you know, where we were going to shoot and what we were doing. But as far as walking into each scene, it was like an introduction then, as far as giving her the overall arching idea of the story, you know, but like months the wings. in advance. Well, the wings, for example, that was her and my thing we made up together yeah. mm -hmm. earlier that year. And and so then we wrote it into the script and, and um, we would talk all the time. Her, this was in an original cut, I think, and we were like, it's way too weird, but she like really wants to fly to Kansas um, for some reason. Um, so she would talk about flying to Kansas a lot. Um, but it just felt a little too Wizard of Ozzy for the movie, yeah. <laughs> basically. But so it's just stuff like that that was uh, just a part, like her descriptions of the wings when we're giving her the bath. That's her real yeah description. Mm -hmm. um, someone asks about the the inspiration for the film, and you talked a little bit about about um, your your learning of, of stories like this and meeting this young girl. He says, coming from the suburbs of New York and reading books about children lost in the subway in school, it struck a chord with me. I guess what I wonder is, is how, um, because how, what, what brought you both to film? Why, why is film the, the manner in which you want to tell a story like this? And sort of what is the conflict between being someone interested in um, issues of social justice and being a storyteller and a fiction independent narrative storyteller right. are those two things ever in conflict yeah um i mean certainly i mean and we didn't I, I mean something that film can do that you know is is really they carry you along emotionally in a way that other mediums i, I we just really believe in the idea of getting lost you know lost in the actual work and there's something to the the, the rhythmic cutting and progression of a of a film that i think can really like is, 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 is that escapism, like it's, that's, that's the beauty of it. You, you really feel like you're along for the ride and you, you've left where you are, um, so. Our goal a lot of the time in our, our shorts and, and this feature and in our future work, I think, is to make you feel on the same plane as the character. So you're not looking down on them. You're not mm -hmm. judging their decisions. Mm -hmm. You're right along the, for the ride. Yeah. And so I think when you're telling a story like this, um, I, yeah, I, I hope that you're, I hope that you're on board with Little's decisions and then Nikki's. I hope that you're not, I, I'm saving your judgment maybe until after the film when you can like discuss it and talk about it. But I think the, the most impactful films, I mean, Capernaum actually is another one that was a big influence for us. Mm. Um, Nadine, in that film when you're and you're on board with Zane's decisions and you, I felt it in the theater when, the first time we saw it where you were just you're like yes this is what you should do next like yeah I don't know it's like when you're watching a horror movie and you're like don't open the door to the basement yeah. don't open the door to the basement and, and whatever that is and they do and and I want you to not feel like that with our characters mm -hmm. I want you to be right beside them um holding their hand hopefully okay. um so that that's a reason I think that um, film is so exciting to, to me and, and to Logan and and telling telling movies that have a, a bit of a message to them. The chance to sort of show something that you you know wouldn't regularly regularly encounter. And for 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 me, like at the, at the genesis of the story, it was this this community that had you know built a, a whole sort of shanty town underground was something I'd never seen before, and that we were so. Wait, and who interested didn't trust in fictionalizing the yeah. institutions that was another huge thing in in these interviews we did and the research we did where people didn't trust 
the um, these institutions I mean, that's like that a were built. Per, that's a pervading theme across so many of the people. Like, because we yeah. we talked like to everyone. dozens and dozens of people uh, on the street, you know, and it started out as research. And Celine said that you know it uh, became, a, doc, became a documentary yeah. project that we made, but it started from a place of just like wanting to interact and you know mine these stories from them and, and hear what their life has been like. And then there's uh, such a pervading sense of um, of just like a fear of some of these systems because they've yeah. just been so burned and in the, the past. And they're friends now. The, a lot of the, um, some of them, it's been many, many years since we've interviewed them and we still talk. So it was lot. about like communicating the, that sensation as opposed to um, the sort of like expositional idea or potential solutions even to some of these like uh, causes, you know, that we're trying to explore. Mm -hmm. It's just can, about like, can you tell us a little bit about um, your own childhoods and how they maybe impacted work, decisions you made in this film or identifications you made in the film? Well, um, I, yeah, I mean, I, I was born in Connecticut in New Haven um, and uh, I, I lived in Jerusalem actually from six to 13. I moved over there because of uh, my dad's work. Uh, and, and lived abroad there, but then moved back to the East Coast, back to Connecticut, and then uh, went to uh, NYU but College, where I met Celine. Logan's dad runs a refugee resettlement agency, and so I think right. throughout his whole he's life, he's done a he lot of, um, you know, he's, he's been work. in the nonprofit sector. He worked with Save the Children for a long time, and when he was in, um, when we were in, uh, when we lived in Israel, he worked in Ramallah helping Arab businesses start up. Um, so I've he now runs a refugee resettlement agency in New Haven and certainly being exposed and working with all of his clients um, mm. has been, uh, you know, like illuminating in a very humbling experience as far as uh, how privileged I felt the exposure that I've gotten, um, you know, growing up and getting to live abroad like that and coming back to America. Mm. Um, I grew up in outside of Pittsburgh. Um, I'm a dual citizen. My mom's British. Um, my, I grew up in both, Leicester, which is a couple hundred miles north of London, and then rural um, Pennsylvania. And I remember not knowing which country I was in because they were both very rural. Mm. Um, my first job was picking strawberries on a farm, um, and, which I did every summer, um, which is how I earned any spending money, um, and then came to NYU. So, um, but I mean, I was a babysitter in New York. I worked my way through college. Um, I was a babysitter in New York City for seven years and a nanny. And um, I think I had a lot of exposure to, and then worked with Jumpstart AmeriCorps. And I think I had a lot of exposure to different types of New York City children, um, which mm -hmm. really influenced. I mean, there was one family in particular that I babysat for who I would, when I was first writing the first draft of the script, I would ask her questions and then just write down her answers. And mm -hmm. that's how I wrote mm -hmm. that character. But this is why we wanted to, you know, we've, we've spoken to a lot of, uh, advocacy groups and a lot of people who've experienced homeless because we we need we these weren't you know these aren't lives that we've led at all so it was really important for us that we yeah. you know engage with the topic and engage with the people who had actually led lives like this to be able to you know find those those moments that felt really specific and honest right um here's a there's a question from chelsea gonzalez i love the film so much would love if, if you could talk about your process for shot listing your cinematography feels so real and raw, and I'm wondering how much was planned out and how much was just feeling it out on the spot. So there's we we always shot list and always go in with a plan because it it's it's just important to do and uh, like even if the whole thing's going to get thrown out because of some production issue or your time gets gets screwed with on the day or whatever. But so we always I mean I think like as a natural aesthetic we. We don't live in a world of no, uh, we don't really like filming wides. Like what Selene was saying earlier about how we really like to stay with the characters, the more that you can be experiencing things from their perspective. So we usually start from that place of sort of trying to understand, you know, what, who's, what's in this scene, you know, what perspective do we want to be tracking? And that the camera's reacting and not having there it, its goal and um that's something we talked about a lot with our cinematographer who will make fun of us because we only really use 50 millimeter lenses <laughs> yeah i think like 70 percent, 75 percent of the film is just off a 50 millimeter um anyway, but yeah just you know we we really loved how claustrophobic it made it and how how much you could connect with um with uh, shayla's face just in that sort of tight proximity yeah. was really important to us 
So there was a style that evolved as we continued to shoot it, but we, you know, we, I think we had to make certain concrete decisions a, really in a big way for the tunnel, just because there was so much that went into lighting the tunnel and for building. a lot of those exterior scenes. And to so build, we, yeah. yeah, so we had to, we had to build and, uh, and flesh out, you know, exactly what we were going to be shooting for some of those larger moments in the tunnel with lights. But then there are, there are some moments like when we were out on the street sometimes that we did keep things very, very fluid and would just sort of give an A and a B as far as where we're gonna go. And Lowell's placed in a position of having to genuinely react to the circumstances that are occurring. And we love that kind of you know, magic when you can sort of like have things happen on the fly. You, you said about that, I think the, there seems to be a very organic and seamless uh, match between your intentions and, and what you realized. So well done. Um, uh, here's a question. Um, brilliant film. That's a good one. We'll start with that. And subject matter. This is from Deborah Charles. My question is, what was the most rewarding moment of your filming and the most difficult? Um, okay. I, I, wanted, I wanted to say rewarding. Um, sure. I loved, you know, the water bucket when we're filling the water bucket, um, that water was really cold. Yeah. And at the time, Shayla was supposed to hold it with me. We had this whole thing. And it was just this really flexible moment for the crew when Shayla didn't want to hold it. She didn't want to touch the water. It was too cold. And so she, I said, okay, stand over there. And I just kept spraying her with water. And it was just, just this really great, beautiful, um, of Lowell being able to be flexible enough to capture it, of our gaffer, Tyler, like moving lights on the, the grips, like moving lights on the fly to like get away from where Shayla's decided to go. And um, Shayla jumping in puddles, like all things that weren't uh, scripted and, and um, that ended up, she was just, I just remember like her peals of laughter in the tunnel and nobody's, everyone's like almost about to laugh. That was great, yeah. yeah. I was gonna say when the shack, fell because oh, that yeah. like we'll just crew up <laughs> that's true that, there was, that a, was true. there was a lot building up to the moment when um nikki and little are fleeing and the shack collapses behind them that was a shot that you oh, know yeah. we knew we were building towards the whole day and we were coming right up against shayla's hours and it was this ongoing process of how much can we actually get it to collapse to make it feel and we got it to a point where we were only going to have one really good take of the shack collapsing because once it collapsed it would be it done. collapsed halfway one time and we're like okay can we prop that back up with like minutes left to go and we got this wonderful take that's in the film uh in her like last minute of being able to be and on shayla set. was jumping yeah. down and, and she so, knew exactly what was happening worst um uh, worst i mean for i think the the second day of production for whatever reason was in the church oh yeah and because of what it took to light the sanctuary portion of it um in you know at night but be, still be able to see it that took us like an extra hour than we thought it would be um and that again it's just like you come right up against Shayla's hours so that was a scene I walked away from that day feeling like like we didn't get that that day yeah just because of how quickly we had to move through and so that was very like but I think debilitating the second day of production I think for me I I Nikki's crying for like the last 20 minutes of the film and so I think that those like two weeks where I was crying was very, um, that was a relief when I remember being in the subway with Lowell, um, our cinematographer and, and Karen, and Peter, our producers and, and Lowell's just like, I can't be here anymore. Yeah. I, have to, <laughs> I have to see the light. I have to yeah. see like, the sunlight because it, it can just, and Shayla's gone by that point because it's just me searching. And, yeah. and I think that there's this thing of forcing yourself to stay in that kind of situation. Um, for all of us, like you included, yeah, it's just we just not fun. spent just... hours, you know, yeah. down in the subway system, taking trains back and forth, and running up and down those stairs. Like credit to you and well, and to Lowell. Yeah. For... he's carrying the camera. I'm yeah. Just... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Craig Paulson writes, uh, no spoilers, but that that ending wrecked me. Oh. Was that always the plan to end the film like that? Also, the pacing of the film was spot on. Ugh, I felt her pain. Thanks for the film. Great job. Thank you so much. It's um, it, that's so cool to hear that. Um, so yeah, I wrote, was... well, I wrote an ending that yeah. Logan first read seven years ago, where Little's fine. <laughs> She's she gets placed with Nikki's mother, which is ridiculous. And the more that we talk to people, the more we discovered how many splintered families and um, this condition. Um, homelessness is cyclical. 
um, there's really, there's such a pattern in, in, in um, what this condition can bring. And um, it's horribly sad. And we just felt like, why would we ever make a movie where we're presenting a reality that is so small? Um, where, where little is just, she's okay. And you can close the book and you can leave and you're like, oh, she's okay. I don't have to think about that child again. Yeah, exactly. Um, we so just, Logan didn't... wrote, Logan actually writes all of our endings. Um, well, because, yeah. no, you do seriously. Well, we write them together, but like you are more pessimistic it, it, than me in general in the endings. We, yeah, we didn't. I want our character to be okay, but. Yeah, I think the original idea was that they never reconnect. Um, and those are sort of the two things that you're, that you're uh, weighing, you know, of like, is she gonna find her again or is she, is she not gonna find her again? Right. And you're not really thinking about the potential third option, but that was, right. for us, it's, the, it's actually, you know, and there's a, there's, you know, you can debate about whether it's a, it's a good or bad thing, but it is Nikki actually changing. Cause I think for her to, to go and, and pick little up again, you're sort of really back at square one. So she, she does make this like very hard um, decision ultimately. Yeah. That was really important to us. Which we hope you see from the from a, a few minutes into the film, like a ten minutes in, when John is really first talking about she needs to be put in school. She needs to be put in school, and you have this kind of narrative throughout that's like she needs to go up top. This is not a place for a child. And Nikki's defiance against that, and then her slow understanding that we we hope is seen that that gradual kind of uh, change. Well, we were talking about mixed genres. It's a coming of age film in many ways. I think, yeah, I, because I think Nikki arrives at some sort of, you, at least from my perspective, she arrives at some sort of understanding which allows her to make a move, a more mature move, or maybe a caring move that she might not have at the beginning. Yeah, so I think that's very satisfying for the audience. Um, it's also just, it's a cop out for her. She doesn't have to say goodbye to it. So, and I think that she wouldn't do do have done it. If she had to just leave, like it's, it's, I don't know. Well, it's very calculated because I, I don't, I, I think she, she see, sees it as an opportunity to break from little without having the like tragedy of, you know, like having to actually give her up. Yeah. But she yeah. makes sure that she's going to be okay, that she's in the hands of law enforcement, you know, but then she takes her opportunity to leave. It's but all of those things you don't really, you know, every, each of us is going to have a different interpretation of, of what the end leaves us with what's coming next, which I think is a very, in that way, it's a very open film. And yet I think it, it ends on a dime, which makes it a very satisfying film because you, you see you, it all builds up to this one decision. So the whole movie is contained in that last, the moment when she chooses to, to move on, it seems. Yeah, like. we like to get out early. Um, very, you know, very quickly from the story, like before you, you're sort of quite ready for it to. So it was, it was important that there, there wasn't any sort of like afterthought to the decision, really. I, I just, um, I just watched a western. Now the title is is escaping me. It was 72 minutes, and you're just like, this is the perfect length for a film. <laughs> so it's like short and sweet and right to the point. Um, um, the, I'm just gonna, there, we only have a few more minutes, but um, uh, one of the viewers, Michael Wyndham, said he absolutely loved the film. Can you tell us if you know when a release date will be so I can tell my friends to check out this gym? Um, and, and I will add to that, um, now that you've made this film, what, is, what are you working on? What are you thinking about next? Release date, um, we're in a very weird time. We, we do hope that this film goes into theaters. So we hope to have more news on that soon. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously theaters aren't a reality yet. So we're just yeah. kind of in a holding pattern, unfortunately. Um, what are we working on next? Um, we're writing a, a yeah, second writing, feature yeah. um, currently that we, we started up as this one was closing and winding down and we were taking it through the, uh, the sound mix and color, the, the rumblings of our second feature came about and so we've been writing it through quarantine and feel really really good about it um well really really i mean it's fine we don't know it, yeah, we're working on it. it's all a work in progress and i think you get there's that quote of you know films are just abandoned um which i just feel really applies to everything i mean there are so many more hours of editing and and refining we could have put into topside but i think that there's a, there comes a place where things feel just raw enough and that's yeah. the, kind of the place that we're looking to get with all of our stages of, of yeah. making this next film too, mm -hmm. um, script included. 
it's a great place to be. The movie I was trying to, it was the Oxbow Incident, which I recommend. 73 really, really powerful minutes. Amazing. Uh, Fantastic. So, um, what a pleasure. I'm really excited that you are making movies and, I, uh, and have made this beautiful film. Thank you both for, for your work and for um, your talent and your vision and your care. It seems like a very, just talking to you, I, I feel that what I observed in the film is very much part of who you both are. So I'm excited to see the next film. Thank, thank you, you so much. Me such a pleasure. A and thank you everyone for, for being here. It's, it's just such an honor that people are, people are watching this little film. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you.